OK, great. All right, well, welcome everyone. Welcome to People Online today. Uh, my name is Craig Johnson. I'm a professor of political science and global development uh, here at the University of Guelph. It's a great pleasure to welcome uh, David Chandler here for our World in 2030 event uh, that's happening on campus. Um, I'll introduce David in, in a few minutes. Um, before getting started, a few housekeeping items. Uh, for those of you joining us online, um, please ensure that your camera and microphone are turned off. We'll be having a Q&A session after David's talk. David will be speaking for about 40 minutes and then we'll open things up for discussion that will both involve people here in the room, but also I'll, I'll monitor the, the online chat and I'm happy to, to relay questions uh, from the floor. Uh, I should add too that the session today will be recorded. Uh, before introducing David, I'd first like to acknowledge that we're meeting on the ancestral lands of the Atawangan people, and most recently the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credits. In making this acknowledgement, we, we offer our respect to the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Métis neighbors as we strive to deepen our relationships. Okay, on to David. Uh, David Chandler is Professor of International Relations at the University of Westminster in the UK. Uh, he's a leading academic in the field of international policy development, and apart from his work with international institutions, has written monographs, articles, and edited collections. I think I read somewhere uh, more than 100 peer-reviewed articles uh, on, on his website, um, and has authored most recently, or, or in recent years, uh, uh, the monograph Resilience, the Governance of Complexity, and has co-edited the Rutledge Handbook of International Resilience. Um, he's also written extensively on the politics of state building, on hegemony, human security, and questions of subjectivity, complexity, and non-linearity in environmental politics. Um, David is a frequent contributor to news and, and public media and public discussions, uh, including appearances and op-eds in The Guardian, The Spectator, The, the Daily Mail, uh, as well as the BBC Al Jazeera and CNN International. Um, so we're very fortunate to have David here today. Please join me in welcoming him. And David, the floor is yours. Thank you. I'm uh, pleased to be here. I'm coming from um, think about resilience. I'm not sure. I don't really know people here, so I'm not sure what you think about resilience. If you think anything about resilience, um, difficult to know. Um, as you can see here, the title is "Cruel Optimism: Resilience in the Anthropocene." And I guess the essence of what I want to ask you is that in the Anthropocene, I'll, I'll go on because, like, normally. Um, more people have heard of resilience than the Anthropocene. Um, so I want to argue that in our contemporary condition, which you might call the Anthropocene, whatever that might be, I don't talk about that, I guess, but resilience can't help us. That's my main sort of thing. I'm imagining that if you have come across resilience, you're thinking about international development issues. Generally speaking, resilience is quite essential to our armory policy making and sort of seeing that as a way of maybe overcoming or evading some of the difficulties with traditional understandings and traditional practices. I want us to think about what, what is it about the thing called resilience that enables us to think of it in these ways as solving problems or enabling us to think things differently. And I want to suggest that um, in today's world it's very, very difficult to think of resilience as doing what it says. It's very difficult to imagine how these other ways of thinking and doing things is actually going to achieve what we want. What I want to argue provocatively is even the best ways of doing resilience, there's a whole field of thought about resilience and how to do it properly. I'm going to talk about some ways people understand resilience as being done wrongly, other ways of thinking about resilience as being done properly. You can think about those things. It doesn't make sense, whatever. I want to provocatively push the boat out and argue that even when we think about resilience as being done properly, whatever that might mean, it still can't work. The 
But in the Anthropocene, there's no way Jose, the resilience, is going to help us. That's my sort of sort of engage. I guess. Moving on to my first slide stroke website. Him entitled sort of cruel optimism. I want to sort of do what I said I was going to do about resilience and look at the limits in context of this concept, cruel optimism. I'm not sure if people are familiar with Lauren Bloom's work or with her cruel optimism idea. That's not what I'm going to talk about um, in, in a very limited and compressed way, of course. What Lauren Bloom argues in their book from 2011, uh, Cruel Optimism. Is that we have a sort of inevitable affective attachment to um, an idea that things will be better. That what we're doing, no matter what, has got value and purpose. You can think about different examples of cruel optimism. It's possible hanging out in the university sector, but no matter how neoliberalized universities are, professors, academics hang on to this belief we're doing something valuable but no matter how management can reduce academia to like an empty exercise there's somehow something is going to go through people's worlds will be opened and our jobs have meaning and satisfaction no matter the limits of the pain and stuff all on all on i think would be arguing so this is a classic case of cruel optimism but you have this belief which is actually harmful to you because if you didn't have that you might be more likely to take strike action, do different things, look for a different job, say to people, you know, this degree, you know, you pay enough money, but you know, it's a really whatever. something like that. But um the cruel optimism can be you know a double-edged sword. But we need to have this faith in order to survive, in order to do our jobs. It's not like wholly terrible. But at the same time, it's sort of corrosive, it's undermining, it's problematic, and it's like, that's why it's a cruel optimism. And I guess in a wanting way, we're trapped. There's not an easy way out of that trap. You can't just sort of give up and like confront the meaninglessness necessarily. Yeah, what I want to argue is that resilience is even better than academia as an example of cruel optimism. That um, despite the end of our modernist belief in progress, linearity, universal understandings, cause and effect stuff, despite our belief in our morality and our ethics, when we're doing development, conflict work, democracy work, we're doing something good. But um, there's something really problematic with the resilience promise. The resilience as a solution or as a way of getting by was evading. So you recognize when you're thinking resilience, I sort of think, you're rejecting like one way of doing it. There's something about this in it's has become so central to our policy making, which is quite critical. But it opens up a certain set of promises. So maybe so what I want to look at is what is that promise? How does it work? What I'm going to suggest is that what resilience promises us is a more um, genuine, a more real approach to the world. So, we think about modernity as being too limited, too, by closing us off from the multiplicities, the differences, the contexts, um, just making assumptions, one size fits all, these sorts of things, silo mentalities, and if you want to be useful to learn, we just focus on this thing, right? Thinking about the entanglement of ideas of development with ideas of gender and democracy, other things. But um, resilience open us, opens ourselves up to reality and it sensitizes us to feedback effects, to the impacts of what we're doing, the consequences, it makes us more sensitive, makes us govern recursively. There's a whole range of different discourses about resilience, how it enables us to maybe engage with the problem in a more real way, a true way, a more objective way. I'm not sure, I mean, I'm, I'm imagining that you might sort of get what I'm getting at resilience and how it works. So what I want to argue is that particularly this understanding is cruel optimism. Um, 
even though resilience promises us a different way of working that's more genuine and more real, more open to complexity and entanglement, um, that it's continuing to reproduce our blindness to the world. It's continuing to reproduce the track of cruel optimism, where we think that um, if only we could do this, if only we could be more real and more true, we'd be able to address the problems. If only we did resilience properly. Um, so the suggestion in my talk is that even when we do resilience properly, as far as we understand it, we're still blind to the, to the inability of resilience to help us. That all it's actually doing is making things worse just like a naive belief in the traditional ethics of academia. So that's my sort of provocative thing, I want to suggest, in the limited time that I have left. Um, but I still think it's important to sort of do the introduction in a full way, so if you get lost in any technicalities, that's what really matters. Um, yeah, cruel optimism. So, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to talk about some ways of doing resilience, which we understand as bad resiliency. And then I'm going to go on to ways of thinking about resilience, which we understand as better. And to illustrate the even resiliency. So, um, what is the technical? I wouldn't definitely be tough on your slides or anything, but particularly something like this, it's not normally do, and it is from a scientific but I was thinking of it, that might be appealing to people. So, who knows? Um, the, the ways of doing resilience badly. What are the sort of tropes and understandings of bad resilience? In the article that I'm putting a little diagram up from, they call it coercive resilience. Coerced resilience. I'm not sure if you come across that expression. Sometimes it's called structural resilience. Sometimes it's called top-down resilience. Um, this is Sorry. It's okay. I did a long introduction just in case people were writing late, so they wouldn't really miss anything. And what I'm talking about is that even though we discuss resilience in different ways, but um, even when we try to improve resilience, that we still reproduce the problem. So this is a diagram about coercive resilience, about top-down resilience. Why is it that resilience doesn't work? Why is it that resilience is so destructive? And these people have, they work, you know, as I say, they're scientists, they're, they're fans of resilience. It's not like I'm using some constant philosophy or anything, or some Marxism or something. The idea is that the more we think sensitively about our problems, the more that we add inputs and adjust things in order to make things better, we think we make things better, we're making them worse. In this case, we're talking about agricultural production. How do we make agriculture more resilient? I mean, this is the bad resilience, so the chances are you may already agree that this type of resilience is One way of making agriculture more resilient might be adding fertilizer or something like that, helping out countries that are less developed, have less technology, um, have problems with soils, with lower, with lower um, nutrients and stuff. But, Yes, we're going to go over and we're going to do resilience, we're going to do international development, resilience assistance. We're going to think about how we produce these fertilizers, how we have things, how we're going to improve crop production. In this set of diagrams, it's all working. Resilience is really good. We, you know, we're doing really good development work. Um, we're helping out increase productivity. We're feeding people. We're evading problems of poverty and we realize that they lead to conflicts and all the rest of it. So we're solving a whole multitude of problems at the same time. However, as time goes on, this is the idea, you can sort of get addicted to resilience. As soon as you start doing resilience work, as soon as you start adding stuff and giving things, doing development work, even with your resilient hat on, the view is that it's like an addiction, that you're going to continually keep doing it. Once you start that intervention, um, Every year, let's just say, I'm not a scientist, I don't know what that but these scientists do. Um, you have to keep on adding more fertilizers, more things. And the worst thing, why it's the sort of cruel optimism, even this type of resilience, is that you think you're doing well. Every year the crop production goes up, every year everyone says you're doing really well, 
isn't it great? Uh, we're going to give you more funding towards you know, teach your ideas to people. Anyway, every year it goes on and on like this, and then there's like a tipping point. Tipping point being that um, no matter how many chemicals you add, you're not increasing agricultural production. All the sort of unintended consequences of supplying those chemicals means that you're polluting other things, killing other types of plants, and whatever. Or the world is running out of chemicals that are too expensive because we're drain on very little that produce. The, 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 case, the basic ontological concept is there's a tipping point. The, um, you realize at some point that what you're doing hasn't worked, even though you thought it was working and working and working and working. And then the, the irony of it is that when you reach this tipping point, you can't go back. There's no nature, even if you wanted to, you know, the nature that was there, the thing that you were helping, accidentally you've killed. Um, so it's like a cruel optimism thing where you're doing your best, you're improving things, um, and then it sort of comes to an end. Now, I'm just using this diagram as an illustration. But what I'm sort of suggesting is that in our contemporary condition of the Anthropocene, it's like reaching that tipping point. And more broadly in a philosophical, contextual sort of framing, it's like the tipping point for resilience itself. That's what I want to suggest. That um, as modernity was coming to a close, as we were losing faith in, I don't know, letting Mark just do their thing, or reason, um, or like a Kantian view of the beneficence of nature, or whatever it was, whatever sort of modernist framework we had, that things were always going to get better, that nature was going to be on our side, that we just had to like, add things, help things, support things, enable things, facilitate things, um, all of those enabling, facilitating things, but um, eventually everything would be fine. What I'm suggesting is in the Anthropocene, we realise that we've reached the end. And so, I'm not the only person who thinks that, there's a, there's a discussion. What people say is that, yeah, of course, there was hey, Chandler, we know a thing or two about resilience, you're not even talking about resilience. This bad stuff, this coercive resilience, this top-down resilience, it's not proper resilience. And why is it proper resilience? Because it deals with anthropogenic inputs. You know, even a five-year-old resilient student would sort of know that resilience cannot be based on human-centered, anthropocentered inputs into the thing. It's obviously going to kill it. It's obvious we could have told you that there would be a tipping point. But all you're doing is destroying nature rather than enabling and facilitating. So, <clears throat> in the Anthropocene, we realized that a lot of things we thought were good weren't good. So, I'm just going to spend another few minutes just on this bad kind of resilience. There's loads of examples, it's not just fertilizer. So you're probably going to be familiar with them anyway. Dealing with flooding. People often argue in the past, building flood walls, it's flooding. How do we pay for them? We have settlements near the walls and the rest of it. Surprise, surprise, flooding gets worse. And we lose all the money, it's a disaster, they say, no, we're going to be resilient, we're going to build that back stuff, we're going to build bigger walls. What happens? You know what happens, it always happens in real life, and also in our demon and gloom media. All that happens is the flooding gets bigger and bigger. Now, modernity, or even coercive resilience, is this struggle against the world. This understanding of resilience as building back better, as adding to things. As learning from the last time, yeah, that bubble wasn't big enough. Maybe sort of building stuff right in that area to make the money to do something else. It's a little like tinkering, constant belief that things are going to be better. However, in the Anthropocene, we sort of realized that actually the way that we understood it was entirely wrong. That um, we, rather than solving things, improving things, enabling things, we were being blind to the world. We didn't think that actually we had to work with the budget, but we need to do proper resilience instead of this coercive stuff. So my time is probably limited, I don't want to necessarily talk about even more. Antibiotics, you know, another example, medicine, curing stuff. Again, it's just seen as like, we think it's good, but then obviously the viruses get worse. You know, the more we do, the more um, bad things happen. And so essentially, in the Anthropocene, well, in debates about resilience, um, we understand that what we thought was good was actually bad. It's a bit like we're reading Walter Benjamin in Frankfurt School or something. But um, the history of modernity, the history of progress, 
even the history of resilience, turns out to be an, an anti-progress. It turns out to be cruel optimism. It turns out to be entirely suicidal and destructive. So we learn that by coercive top-down structural resilience, engineering resilience is um, cruel optimism, is counterproductive. As I said at the beginning of my lecture, that's what I'm going to do. So the key thing about what I'm going to talk about is how, when we learn about it, and we learn about how to do resilience properly, that that doesn't really help us. Because I think that everyone will agree that coerced top-down resilience is problematic. Although 20 years ago, 15 years ago, it would have been maybe a different understanding. It would have been a nice thing to be giving to us and supporting us. But time moves really quickly. That's for whatever reasons, for its own reasons. So, key point coming up, um, what is it that we learn about how to do resilience properly? What we learn is to respond to feedback effects, to listen to the world, not to think about our human-centered aspirations and goals and things, not to think just because we want to protect something or do something, that that means that we can do it. Because the more we're thinking about ourselves, the less we're letting the world tell us how it wants to be governed. As long as we're building walls against something, against rising, we're not listening. Rising is our friend. In, in like nice resilience, in community resilience, in bottom up resilience, whatever the new resilience might be, we're not like going to war. We're not going to war on flooding. Flooding actually isn't our enemy. Flooding is like Gaia tapping us on the shoulder and saying, hey, there's something wrong here. I'm going to give you a little bit of flooding to enable you to think about how you do things differently. If you ignore me, I'm going to give you, you know, more of the messages. I'm going to make the flooding worse until eventually, if you listen to what I'm saying, would be the idea. But um, as long as we're sort of self-centered, confident in our own capacities to do things, to like give, enabling, and facilitating things, as long as we're thinking in a self-centered, anthropocentric, human-centered way, we're not listening to the world, would be the basic point. Even like diseases and things, instead of going to war on them, we listen to them. What are the diseases telling us? In a sort of community bottom up resilience way, what we're thinking is the problem is actually us. We don't need to be protected. Our goals are the things that we need to be securing. We need to be thinking about how we work with things, how we understand we live in a relational, entangled world. No more ad hoc progenic solutions. We can't give people development, even in a nice resilience way. We can't give people democracy, no matter how much we bond them and sanction them or whatever. We realize somehow, magically, that it's counterproductive. We can't give people anything anymore. And we also can't go to war with it, see them as problems. In a black and white way, we're good, these problems are a threat. So in a community resilience way, even climate change is not a threat to us. Climate change is a consequence of us. We are climate change. Climate change is telling us this is who you are. If you humans want to be like that, this is how you know your world is going to manifest itself. Okay, yada yada yada. So how do we do um, resilience in a way of responding to reality in um, tracing the effects of what we do? How, how are we sensitive to feedback? How is that going to help us? There's many different ways. Time. Some ways it's to do with like traditional knowledge, other ways of being, non modernist ways of being, less anthropocentric, less like uh, that humans are separate from the rest of the world, with special powers and control of knowledge. Other ways of thinking about the world which are more equalizing, more relational, more equalizing in different ways. So, you know, you might call it local knowledge, indigenous knowledge ways of working. So um, another way is like, because modernists can't, modernists can't necessarily assimilate and instrumentalize non-modern knowledge. Sometimes that seems like expropriative or problematic in different ways, we don't need to go into. Other ways people often think about technology. A lot of our development institutions, our international agencies, they talk about data, they talk about big data, they talk about the inside of things, because Big data and the thing, I don't want to bore you with big data and stuff, 
datification, how we turn uh, aspects of the world into meaningful areas of messages. Once we understand the diseases and bad weather and like bearing messages about the reality of the world, we realize that everything bears a message about the reality of the world. What, what color the leaves turn in autumn, um, what time they turn different colors, that's all messages. That's all telling us about nutrients, about the weather, about temperatures, about locations, about relationships. But as humans, we can't see those messages. The idea is that technology can help us. We can be sensitive to things. We can think about correlations rather than causation. We can begin to see beyond a narrow human centered way of thinking about things. That's the sort of idea. In new resilience, in sensitive relational resilience, we expand our world, we expand our thinking and our consciousness and our sensitivity into the world so we can be more real, more contextual, more real-time, more responsive. It's sort of like a superhuman or like a more than human. How do we think about it? One expression that I saw recently was that the old human and the old ways of doing resilience was a bit like being a domestic cat. But, you know, domestic cats, they're fiercely autonomous, independent, they think that they're like doubling themselves and everything. But they have no consciousness of their world, of their relationships, their dependencies on their owners that like feed them and keep the houses and all the rest of it. No. The cat is even entirely ungrateful, disrespectful, just based on its ignorance and the smallness of its world. You know, cats don't be happy until the Anthropocene. And hum we imagine humans as being like that. So just like the cat, so like self-centered and wrapped up in themselves and unaware of the world. So resilience to just to sort of I realize at times rapidly in the beginning. Resilience to is how do we get into the world? How are we more real? How are we more sensitive? So I don't know, uh, Bruno Latour, you may have come up as Bruno Latour, apps and network theory. It's a way of thinking about relations rather than entities that um in modernity, I want to be more philosophical or technical or any of these things. In modernity, we imagine that things are separate entities with essences in a fixed grid of time and space. What Bruno Latour, any relational theorist, would say, that's not right. But we, we can't just like cut an entity up, thing up, and find out about it. But a thing's properties, its powers, are relational. But in, in some relational context, something is good, something is bad, all the rest of it. But we need to move beyond sort of fixed modernist understanding. But we need to think about things in their relations. One way of doing that is a bit like with the tree example that I just told you about, is being able to datify them, being able to understand those other entities, what they're trying to tell us, how they tell us different things in different relations. A good, I think one of my favorite examples of a book that came out last year tries to do that is the revenge of the real politics of a post pandemic world, mentioned Brexit. In the Benjamin Batten world, it's a bit like humans um, have one of those quantitative self Fitbits where you're continually paying attention to your health. You're continually, continually being reflexive. If you have a temperature or whatever, if you're not sleeping so well, you know, it's brought to your attention and you're thinking about how do I respond? How do I adapt to those things? How do I turn my temperature, whatever it is, my lack of sleep, into a message, into a sign that I can respond to? The logical extension of Benjamin Bratton's world is that as humans, we're more than just minds and reason thinking about doing things, uh, you know, make, uh, directing things into the world. We're also material beings in material relationships. We're, we're producing, we're consuming. How do we understand humans as data objects rather than data subjects? The book is like a pandemic thing because COVID is a great example. So we can't like see COVID, but and it's not about our thinking and our feelings and like, yeah, we're autonomous subjects, we have the right to wear masks, not wear masks. That's a material reality. If we could see COVID, we'd be able to respond to it. So how can we use data? How do we use datification to see and respond to things? That's the sort of promise of a sensitive resilience. Because we can't, even as much as we want them to turn towards non-modern cultures, non-modern knowledges those sort of sensitivities, those awareness of relations. In the anthropocene, those relations are also disrupted. But even if something used to happen in a certain way at a certain time in a certain climate, 
uh, in today's, as you know from our survey data today, those things can't be relied upon. Even traditional, local, contextual, indigenous, if you want to call it that knowledge, doesn't necessarily work in the ways that it used to. How do we use data, internet of things to sensitize, to, to see things as processes, to see things in their relations? So one example of how we might do that might be charts. I'm only using this because I don't really do feel I've got anything in the from reading books, but I did happen to go to Jakarta and do some work past Jakarta to feel like a flood monitoring agency. And Jakarta is useful for different ways of thinking about sensitivities to a problem. It's a major me megapolis or something. The difficulty is that it's under sea level. You know, it's got no future in the Anthropocene. Like many, many coastal megacities. Anyway, so this is a map of flooding in Jakarta, where not only is there the risk of flooding from the sea, there's also a whole network of canals and everything. It's a whole watery underneath, as well as the next door to. There's flooding that's happening all the time. How can we do, how do we have a resilience discussion? Now, in old-fashioned resilience, people argue we need to concrete over the rivers. In the 19th century or whenever the area was colonized by the Dutch, Stuff like that. The Dutch were obviously modernist experts in coercive modern types of resilience. They would like reshape rivers, whatever. They wanted to concretize over the rivers and the water. You know, like going to war on the problem, trying to like concrete it off, fence it off, wall it up. However, nowadays we realize that that's work because all of those walls and things, they're all leaking and flooding is, is back again with a vengeance. The more you concrete things, the more you wall them off, the more you proliferate. Problem. We make it even more difficult to regulate and to predict. Anyway, what I wanted to tell you though is they came up with a more community resilience, the use of technology to enable the citizens of Jakarta to sort of moderate their relationships with the water, to be aware of it. The project was sponsored by Twitter and other people. The idea was that you would, when you come across a bit of flooding, as I say, I'm not an expert, I'm just trying to visit and chat to people or whatever, uh, you would take a photo. Photo would be geolocated, so people would know where it was. You would measure the depth of the water, or at least work out you know, for this person tool or whatever, and then you would like um, <coughs> text it to Pedro Jakarta, the NGO. And then, obviously, the more people are texting and flooding stuff, you have a real time map emerging. A real time map, not with predictions of flooding or something like that, you can't really predict it in a city like Jakarta, but you can see it. Yeah, when lights are, lights are flashing, things are coming up, people are reporting it. What happens in a sort of adaptive, real-time relationship? You're going to avoid the flooding. You know, you're going to go around and see your family members you might be affected by. You're going to be in a real-time, responsive, adaptive, living relationship with a problem. You're no longer thinking of walling it off and fencing it off. You're seeing the world in reality, you could even call it as a sort of, you know, an imaginative, productive way of dealing with it. Anyway, so that might be a, a useful way of thinking of how we use technology and people and citizens. We do a lot of things, a lot of positive stuff in thinking like that. If you wanted to have a good resilience, maybe you don't have to things, but generally speaking, this wouldn't be the worst type of resilience. There's other types of resilience in Jakarta as well, the informalized used to be called slum dwellers, people lived in informal housing, they continually have to cope with the of the river. They have a, you might call a local knowledge or indigenous knowledge thing of knowing when the river's going to be flooding, people might contact them from up the river, they might be able to sense and see it, and they would move out of their houses. The first floor would just be on stilts, like many people who live in flood areas, and you would move yourself out, you'd move back in afterwards. So that's like a, a less technological way, but it's still like a real time process of adaptation. So I took a one, I want, to, I want you to hold in your minds that sort of way of thinking about resilience, I mean, whether it's good or bad. I think it's a round basis you might want to get to. And just use one more example of resilience, which um, I think is even nicer. Something we say I never thought so. I know it doesn't turn out well, but nevertheless, it sounds like it's even nicer. And that's like New York Harbor Oyster Tension. So here where Wakefield was born some nice articles about it. The idea is instead of using technology or relying on like local knowledge, we can use nature and natural knowledge, a whole range of alternative resiliency ways. 
What does it mean to use nature and natural knowledge? It's called a waste process. It's a waste related thing where you have like a bed of oysters, a chain of oysters that are growing and thriving. When like the floodwaters arrive, the oyster beds like rise with them. The oysters are growing and adapting and relating, and they're continually forming a barrier. Now, I've heard people complain about that as well. People will complain about everything. You know, critical theorists, they need something to criticize. They will have argued it's exploiting the oysters. You know, just rearing oysters just to be sort of saving resilience. I'm not going to say it. I've said it, but I'm not going to say it. No, that's the way. So, so there's a whole range of nice resilience things. Now, what is wrong with those? Even the nicest resilience things. I would argue that in the anthropocene, these are like terrible things. This is real cruel optimism. Even when you're doing nice resilience, why is it cruel optimism? Why is it so terrible? Because the irony of ironies is that we think we're hearing the message. We think that we're adapting. We think that we're being really clever. We're ticking all the boxes. We're bringing high technology, imaginative work. We're doing citizen participatory developmental democracy. We're doing multi-species democracy work so that the world can be safe for us and the oysters at the same time. We can extend it to other species collaborative works. If we were Donna Haraway or Anna Singh or other radical feminists, relational ontologists, or materialists, or um, multi-speciesists, they'd want to be happy. However, in the Anthropocene, I would argue it's cruel optimism, and it's refusing to see the consequences. It's refusing to listen to the messages of climate change. It's refusing to respond to feedback complaints. Because all that happens, even when we do the oyster types of stuff, is that we can just continue producing and consuming like we did before. All that's happening when the slum dwellers, the informal, living in informal settlements on the side of the river, when they're doing their to and fro, they're just protecting the city dwellers in their rich parts of the city from the impacts of flooding. You could argue the same thing with any other sort of um, marginal subsistence living in agriculture, use and fertilizer, you should use other things. You're just keeping people on the edge of subsistence so that other people can live you know, a life of luxury and I have all their big cars and, and all the rest of it. And so in the Anthropocene, these things that we do often think as the best case scenarios for resilience are the worst case scenarios because we feel really good about these like community folks and other resilience things. And infinitely is so good about it, we just keep living the life that we were living before and we just keep on destroying the planet. That's what people are. So I'm not saying that's my personal normative position. I'm just saying that if we were to think about resilience in the framework of cruel optimism, we would see that there's like the resilience isn't a solution. It's just another part to be ourselves that, um, that we can keep on doing what we used to do. The resilience is no better than the, some sort of techno modernism, futuristic approach. That may be even worse because we don't really see the true limits. Yeah, so that's my Brian Upbeat's message for today. So that's, that's that. And I just pray. Okay. With the well, news. <laughs> thank you, David. Uh, I hope people online, I don't know where to look here. I think the camera's up there. <laughs> I keep looking at the ceiling anyway. Um, I hope people online can hear me okay and hear us. Uh, if you have questions online, feel free to share them and I'll relay them uh, in real, real time here. But uh, we'd love to open the, the floor to everyone now um, uh, with questions, comments, observations, uh, certainly a lot of, of uh, critical perspectives, I think, to take in mind in thinking about both resilience as a concept and a practice, but also development uh, and, and how we might think about, about its relationship to resilient systems, to human populations, and the city of Jakarta. Um, so, Fire away. Uh, Ian Spears has raised his hand. Uh, so thanks very much. Uh, that was a provocative uh, discussion and or presentation, and um, uh, and I learned a lot. And it uh, certainly got me out of my normal, boring ways that or conventional ways. That I think, but so um, I, I mean, I'm not sure I have a question as much as. Um, I want to have you elaborate a little bit more. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Canadian historian Ronald Wright, who talks about progress traps, that we keep on 
uh, that technology allows us to continue solving problems. Um, and in fact, we, we make things worse. So he says, you know, we find ever more efficient ways to catch fish. And it's terrific as long as there's fish. But at some point, we, and Canadians know something about this because we overfished in our East Coast fishery. Um, but that it actually leads to disasters. So I was thinking about uh, parallels with that. But I was also wondering, is is foreign aid another example of your uh, bad resilience, um, if that's if that's the right term, um, insofar as we keep we continue to think that <laughs> I'm a little reluctant to say this with our foreign aid uh, expert here, although he certainly is with quotation marks. <laughs> well, I know that Craig is uh, is is well aware of the good, the bad, and the ugly of. Uh, for an aid that is it that we continue to think we're solving problems, we think that we're advancing development, um, but that in fact, just as you're talking about this cat who thinks that everything's fine, it, that it that these that a community might be unsustainable, or at least it would be unsustainable in that environment um, if the foreign aid ever stopped. And you're, I mean, are you essentially saying that we're propping up uh, a problem, uh, thinking that we're solving it? Uh, and yet, w were it to stop, that 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 project would essentially collapse. <sighs> um, <laughs> well, have I got the right? Am I understanding you correctly? At least yeah. some some. Yeah, of that's the beginning of like the door that might be open. Um, obviously, if it was true that inevitably foreign aid was going to make things worse and development aid would lead to underdevelopment and democracy production and promotion would lead to protectionists and to being for peace and make worse worse. I mean, you know, that was, it would be devastating for many MA programs, ethical foreign policy of governments, you know, the existence and legitimacy of foreign institutions, international institutions. So, I mean, just thinking about such a complex point and seeing how history and then this is to be true, you know, would, would be a terrible thing to contemplate. So, um, but maybe the problem is even worse. Those things are obvious, and like the last 20, they're obvious because it's only been in the last 20 years that we've been able to do test tube experiments. Because during the Cold War, for those of you who don't remember the Cold War or anything, yeah, the world was divided between Russian, America, capitalism, and communism. You couldn't do democracy promotion or development stuff or security work because you had to give money to the people on your side and not the other side. It was impossible to do liberal, internationalist, universalist, nationalist because real politics, as I call it, got in the way. So it's only since then that the terribleness of our desires to help improve things have been revealed to be purely projections of our fantasies. And the worst thing being, even if we're nice, even if we don't intend to support colonial hierarchies and reproduce inequalities, we still sort of are. And maybe the worst thing is that even though we've opened that door, we haven't opened it properly because we sort of think that if we're doing development aid and making it worse, it's because their own contexts are so bad. It's like it's down to them. Um, I mean, that was true as well, because obviously, not obviously, um, why would we need to look at it as that? Why can't we see it that the problem is like hundreds of years, hundreds of years of colonialism and inequality and extraction of resources? That are, that's the problem. The problem isn't these societies that have conflicts and other development. The problem is like an international system that sort of reproduces that. So, you know, I think once you open the door to a reality that's even more real than the reality of resilience, you know, it draws us along the path of, you know, it would be entirely um, problematic. So I'm, I, you know, yeah, so what can you do? You know, I'm just a messenger. It seems to me that uh, these things are very obvious. But um, if you think how much our heads have changed from 20 years ago, at the end of the Cold War, you know, when I teach my students, 20 years ago, because I'm teaching 20 years, 
they really wanted to do liberal work. They wanted to go and save the world and bring development and peace and, and all the rest of it. I'm telling them then, this is wrong. Nevertheless, that's what the world sort of world. That's how we had international development, international relations with Bumi. People don't think that today, or less people think that. Um, people realise that um, there's a closure, that all the time we thought we were doing good, not only were we doing bad, but we, we couldn't even see that we were the problem, not them. And the more that happens, um, the more, no, it's not even pleasant. It's, it becomes utterly corrosive to realise that everything you would you know you were taught was problematic. So, more positive questions. <laughs> uh, thinking of uh, best ways of proceeding and some that they are also cool optimism. What would you think is a good responsible alternative to not kill ourselves and listen to those messages? Just yeah. So it's difficult because you know we our heads are our heads. And I'm not really sure that the earth is telling us stuff. I know, I, I'm not sure that our contemporary heads are any better than our modernist colonial heads. I wish it was true that um, something positive could come out of the end of everything that we thought was true. But my guess is that all that can really happen is just another set of illusions, another set of problems. It just seems to be how it works. Um, I think at the moment we're going through a bit of a crisis at the end of modernist dreams of progress and universal enlightenment and knowledge we could just store up over here and more and more and then just take it out of the drawer and apply it somewhere. So that's like a crisis. But I think we'll, you know, I think that we'll we'll come to terms with, you know, our contemporary condition. Um, but I don't think it's necessarily positive or truer or anything. I'm not sure. I mean, these are difficult questions. I mean, it's difficult enough. Just to begin to ask the right questions. I don't have any solutions or anything like that. Andy, did you have a question? Yeah, I have a couple things related around the method. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, I was listening to the CBC, our you know, Canadian equivalent to BBC radio, uh, this morning on the drive into Guelph and they interviewed, Matt Galloway was interviewing a couple of people. One of them was a climate, a youth climate activist, Surrey BC, who's off to the COP meeting. Um, another one was a UBC professor. And it was an interesting, like the question that he asked both of them was, how do you maintain your optimism in the face of just such overwhelming evidence that we're headed for disaster? And it was fascinating to listen to them then, but even more fascinating in light of what you've been talking about, because both of them insisted on being optimistic, that it is a struggle every day, they wake up, but they, they just like are convinced that it is better to be optimistic um, and to keep fighting some kind of good fight, and so therefore this youth activist from Surrey, BC, is going off to Egypt, and and this professor is still going to do their research. And so I guess I want to probe you a bit more on how you characterize people's reasons for being optimistic. Um, and if I heard you correctly, it is about kind of us and our illusions of us wanting to appear to be doing good, even when there's evidence to the contrary. But aren't there, I mean, just like, just aren't, you know, aren't, isn't there something more than that going on with people? It's, it's, perhaps not illusion, it's the fact that sometimes there are these kind of black swan situations where where like sometimes things look impossible but then then the unexpected happens. Right? There are these there are these slim chances, right, when something happens and like ninety nine out of a hundred times it doesn't, but then there's that like you, you 
win the lottery, right? Um, there's there's that. There's the real chance. Um, there's also, you know, to take a different kind of example. Um, I mean, people just pers people do persist in doing bad things all the time, even though they know it doesn't help them. Like kind of smoking, right? Is the classic example. So I guess I just want to probe you a bit more on your characterization of why people continue, because I think it's a little bit glib just to say we're happy to live with our illusions. I think there might be other reasons going on. Here's some like questions. I think that for many people, so they are optimistic, but not in like a traditional developmental type way. Um, yesterday I was talking about Jairus Grove's Savage Ecology Book. Uh, Jairus Grove, trained by William Connolly and Jane Bennett. You know, there's like William Connolly, maybe you know, Connolly. There's an optimist in there. There's a sort of recognition of the disastrousness of the world. There's also an understanding that we think in you know, sort of relational, imminent ways of creativity, as you say, accidents. Giles Graves says that the end of the world isn't the end of anything. It's just the end of like our particular imaginary of the world. William Connolly would argue we need to like you know be seers into the future with like a sense of, of generosity. But there's always going to be creativity. Whether it might not be the fact that we sort of particularly like or, or whatever. So there's a lot of that. Now, my personal view is I don't like, it's not for me personally, if I was to bring my own normative person into the room, I think that's really wrong for these white privileged white professors to, to do that, to have that optimism uh, in those ways, to like say that we should be trained as seers with this generosity stuff. To me, that's sticky. And I sort of think when I sort of try and find books that I can find. <laughs> I sort of think like uh, Frankfurt School, I think of um, Theodore Adorno, and I think of Adorno's struggle against nihilism. Adorno would say, but those people with their optimism, they're actually more nihilistic because they're trying to sell us to be optimistic with these pathetic, terrible things, these privileged ideas of hope, um, these like palliative. Palliative politics is another thing that some of my colleagues do. The living well, dying well stuff. That we should be optimistic. Yeah, you know, autonomous say, you know, this is worse. If, if this is what being positive is, if this is what resilience is, um, if this is the alternative, um, give me like a thoroughgoing balance that says we have to end this, whatever this is, before we can even begin to start thinking about something. So Normatively, I would be much more of a sort of adorno and negative dialect, sort of theorizing from outside. Now, that's not why solving the problems of the world. So I'm not saying this for everyone. I'm just sort of sharing my inner thinking. And then to also experiment with what would it mean to be thinking like, what would it mean to be trying to theorize from the outside, to sort of be optimistic through an ending of the world, not an optimistic, that's what I sort of mean. What we call optimism is so great is because it's still saving a world, even if we talk about you know, other worlds and possibles. So I'd rather be experimental with trying to sort of think about what it might mean to be thoroughly critical. I'm not arguing that anyone else should do that, or that it's going to work or whatever, but that's just what I can, as an academic, if I was like a policy person doing development, obviously I wouldn't work that way. Else. But that would be sort of bad faith. That's why I wouldn't do that. That's so everyone's got to do that. I'm an academic and that's sort of bad faith. You know, I don't necessarily really believe in the values of being. So bad faith is how we live. Cruel optimism is how we live. There's no like solution to cruel optimism. We have to learn to live and therefore we have to sort of tell ourselves stories about how we might do that. That's the point of Lord Bellon's book. Nice. Jonathan, what's your question? It, um, your comment? Yes, thank you, David. That was great. I guess we, the way you were talking about resilience, it seems like it's just a, a theodicy, that it's just 
you know, there's evil in the world, but God's still good, and we can use it, and we can still continue as we're doing. And um, so the way that that sort of impacts me, I guess, is sort of I got this image of the phoenix. You know, the phoenix dies, uh, burns in its own ashes, and it's reborn again from those ashes. And that sort of resilience is sort of endless loops, I guess. And that the problem is cool optimism, or you just mentioned the word hope. And I guess I was thinking that is the problem hope because of the future orientated nature of hope that people aren't do, changing things now because there is a possibility in the future at some point that it will just change. Is that it? So the, the cool optimism creates, uh, it like paralyzes us to stay the same. And actually what we need is helplessness and hopelessness because that that's going to be instigating a change. Well, it's, um, I guess the world is paralyzing us. The world, of, what we haven't mentioned, the elephant in the room, is that like, the world understood as a world of politics, of left and right, and class, you know, so ridiculous, you know, the same as we it's just like an ancient person from the last century. But it seems, the scientists are telling us, that without a world of politics, of humans engaged, the world begins to disappear. The idea of us as humans, as subjects capable of transforming something, is, is like ridiculous because the world is just a mass of things that's so overwhelming. Um, you know, hum it's possible that modernity was made by humans, you know, in struggle, but it's fair enough to say that time and space and all the other modernist frameworks that we invented for ourselves may not be like objects, be true in some sense. But they were a framework through which we created ourselves as humans and a world that was amenable to humans. Now we live in an inhuman world. We like to think it's because of climate change. And I'm not saying that climate change doesn't exist or something like that. But there's also other factors that lead to an inhuman world and the limitations of being human. So the failure of the Enlightenment slash modernist project, um, if you, in my personal view, I think there has been a failure to that project. That failure has like a legacy, it has like real effects. Yeah, the effects are that the world makes us powerless. You know, it removes us. Um, it makes the world entirely immune to our, our action upon it. So um, there's sort of that in the background. So what Adorno is sort of saying, I think in my reading, I'm not like a philosopher or anything like that, I'm such an person. Adorno is saying that we don't have to give up, and uh, equally, we don't have to like be optimistic in these sort of privileged and facile ways. That the struggle to end the world um, can be an enabling and creative one. And I don't know, I don't want to be on board of questions. You might think that like Marx had a similar perspective. Marx wasn't into celebrating workers and cultures and identities and stuff. All we were saying was that. We haven't begun to be human yet. But, um, if we don't end the world, we'll never know what it might mean to be human or something like that. So there's, there's like other ways of thinking about these things. Um, however, uh, because there's been such a failure of the modernist project, it doesn't seem possible to just start again in another modernist project. You know, that would be ridiculous. No one's going to buy that. So it's a little bit more tricky the second time round. And it may be that climate change, you know, you know so I'm not sure, I'm, a, I'm not like a, a sort of an eco-determinist, either a Marxist eco-determinist or an ecological determinist, but, you know, this is the end, literally in a climate change way. So there's like a whole range of background conditions which are favourable, I think. You know, these are the questions I, you know, my, my, see my job is just like raising some of these questions, I'm not qualified don't have a crystal ball, and, you know. But so I, 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 I think this is more than not just thinking in an ecologically deterministic way. It's not nature that's trying to get us. I think we've already killed ourselves in such an overdetermined way. It's difficult to pick ourselves up, unfortunately. Mm. Uh, hopefully, I'm wrong. Like normally, I mean, you know, I think you know, I'm a big fan of hoping to be wrong with like, the work that I do. I wouldn't like my dark vision of the game to be true, that would be depressing.
Well, I want, I'm waiting for him to ask the question because well, I'm wanting to ask the question for him because I feel like he should be asking the question. Not because he's no pressure. There. Um, <laughs> what question is Craig going to ask? Yeah, that's the question. Yeah. See how smart you are? What is it? Well, I guess, I mean, I uh, just, it's, if, for my colleagues that know me, will find this supremely ironic because I, in many ways, identify with a lot of what you're saying, but I can't help but but feel like this negative, uh, this pessimistic view is being constructed. And and I mean, I'm thinking about scholars, or you know, uh, I'm not sure he's a scholar, but someone like Matt Ridley, who who seems to have market solutions for everything, um, and would would take issue with what uh, you're saying about that this is all you know going off a cliff, um, and would say, what are you talking about? Um, that you know that 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 we can't adapt to things like climate change. He's not denying climate change. He's saying that in fact. Uh, we're we're pretty good at building resilience, uh, and 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 uh, and that we that 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 problems of flooding are ones of development that are solvable provided there's the will and provided people are you know unleashed uh, from the you know strictures of government and are able to innovate and find and find solutions. So you know, I'm not sure you know I'm. I'm I'm wanting to. Not, I'm not necessarily an advocate of that position. I'm wanting you to to respond to the, the what the optimists would say. Is that your, is that no, your no, no, <laughs> nowhere close. It's a, good, it's a good question. It's a good question anyway. So I'm happy to accept it, even if it's not what you. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, so that's a good question. So, to my own mind, I think it's quite possible that there's like loads of sort of technological development. Things. If you look at the history of humanity and stuff, that's generally how it works. You know, from Malthus onwards, everyone's saying, you know, we're doomed, we're doomed, we're doomed, we're doomed, we're doomed. Humans are pretty inventive. Um, I see no reason to think that we're doomed. From a climate change perspective, the reason why I think we're doomed is from a political perspective, from a political failure of a modernist environment project. Now, that project can fail as well as having technology. Because that project was a project of a human-centered, transformative approach to things, an open-ended understanding of the future. Um, that seems to have failed. It's been manifested in like failed disasters of, I don't know, socialism, communism, you know, in history. To my mind, that's that's like the problem, not um, climate change and technical things. That's mainly because I'm a political theorist. I know nothing about climate change and technical things. I was giving a present a principal theory presentation. I was talking about discourses of resilience, how their the self-understanding works, bringing in a little bit of pragmatic sort of relational cruel optimism, cruel optimism, to sort of just have a discussion about those things. And if you were fans of resilience, you've already given up on modernity in those ways. My understanding is how we think of resilience is as a relational process of adaptation. So resilience has already rejected a sort of high modernist technical approach. That's why resilience is a nice space to work in, you know, because what are the consequences? You know, once you give up on modernity, all you have is like the end of the human. Well, it's, it's inevitable. So, so that's what I'm looking at. So because I'm imagining to myself in my head that oh, well, it's going to be like a big developmental, just in my imagination, I don't know. A big developmental resilience sort of community, and I'm going to try and say to them, maybe you need to think of the consequences of this, your positionality, your understanding of resilience, and how it works, because maybe we need to rethink it. Because in our contemporary condition, it seems that resilience is based on numbers. That's all I'm sort of doing. So it could well be that um, they'll do something technological. I'm not the person to talk about. Now the real question. <laughs> Pretty sure this is the question I'm going to ask. Well, I was maybe my first question was closer to what I thought you were going to ask me. Anyway, We've taken uh, up all the good you, questions. You, um, you guys have some rivalry there. <laughs> He's <laughs> very friendly. He's too friendly. Um, David, thank you for your talk. I, I um, I guess one question that immediately sprang to mind in hearing your your discussion of resilience 
was the distinction between what you're calling coercive or, or bad resilience and these other forms of, of good or grassroots or forms of resilience that recognize feedback and relationships. And, and, and when I, whenever I encounter writing about resilience, and, and I think we were talking about sort of the way in which resilience is characterized in, in the natural sciences, I, I think of kind of that, that uh, buzz hauling panarchy loop where, where you've got these systems kind of reaching their tipping points, tipping over and then recovering it going over and over again. Um, and and a question for me is often, I think you share this, this question, is where is the agency? Like where is agency in those systems that are, are somehow responding to external stimuli? From your talk though, I came away with the question of where where is the authority? And I, I'm not sure if I'm getting this right or not, but it seemed to me that coercive resilience or bad resilience is is detrimental and destructive because it's rooted in, in a form of authority that that is both consciously trying to avoid the problem that it sees as a problem, but also because it's doing so through coercive measures. And I guess putting on a development studies hat that automatically makes me sort of think then about what that means for the role of public authority, for the role of the state. And even with the example of Jakarta, like, like I think about all of that crowdsourcing that goes on, but if, if lives lost due to flooding is something we want to achieve, then I would think at some point authority or some kind of coordinating mechanism might come into play. Um, so two questions. I'm not sure that I'm going to answer it, but um, I think that modernity was very like authority centers in the states, top down, and those sorts of things. And as you say, the more coercive, even modernist forms of resilience are more authority reliant. But to my mind, the, the logic of resilience is a totally flat one. It's anti-authority. It's, it's like the imaginary. The imaginary is the world polices itself. So in the Jakarta imaginary, I'm not saying it's true because he depends on Twitter and like local authorities support and all this other, this other things. The imaginary is that in the future we can create a self-governing community, even living on like a flooded megatropolis or whatever, they still won't need external intervention. Resilience is really about making external intervention unnecessary because we know external intervention is just going to make problems worse. That's the resilience sort of message. And then so the idea being that this is just the beginning of creating the new citizen of the future, the new sensitive, aware, self-knowing community where we start with the flooding, but then we think about medical emergencies. We think about policing. There's policing that's exactly the same thing. Broken windows, burglary, violence, attack. People then modulate themselves so they don't go in that area or all the rest of it. No one's calling the police anymore because they know this is just going to make things worse. They're just going to feed other people, whatever sort of thing. But, um, and that's when we when we export resilience, we're really exporting the imaginary that these marginal communities or you know whatever it is that needs our help, we can make them resilient as in self-governing, as in autonomous, as in not needing us, whether they need us to you know. It's always paradox. Even when, what, what is it that we give them when we give them this? It's we give them the capacity to self identify. You now they're living under a volcano or whatever. We give them an internet of things to like sense stuff so that they can manage their volcano syncopation, their relationship themselves. The only point being, the critical point that I'm sort of making is that that, that can't work in a world where the status quo is the problem not the solution. And maybe in a modernist world when we liked ourselves a lot, the status quo was pretty good. But in our world of the Anthropocene, you realize that, that that's not tenable anymore, that we can't really sell that in those ways. And so a lot of people with critical resilience from a Foucauldian neoliberal perspective, the, you know, blaming the poor for problems of poverty, they have to manage their own poverty. No, I'm not trying to sell that sort of critique of resilience. You know, that's um, it's quite a modernist way of thinking about this thing. So I'm trying to sort of draw out what resilience is, how it works, 
the sort of secular strength within it that of, of inevitable failure, mm. hoping to be productive. You know, it went a little bit. I want an angry, resilient people. You're saying I shouldn't have a career, this is my job, I'm the resilience person. So, you know, I have to go to other, find other universities. People who have more at stake in the resilience industry. You mean, need more geographers. <laughs> anyway, so... Yeah, I, I mean, I know that you and I and a few of us are going to continue this conversation later on, and it's it's tempting to keep it going, but I, I, I recognize that you've been standing for over an hour. I'm not on trains and buses for a long time. <laughs> but um, <laughs> if we've exhausted the audience's question, and question Yes. So thank you for a great presentation. So my question would be, what makes this specific uh, philosophy of cruel optimism so popular among uh, scholars or among politicians? What it makes so appealing theoretically and philosophically as opposed to other ways of thinking about these things? That's, that's a really good question. Um, Lauren Perrault's book, um, Call Optimism, is like hugely, hugely influential book. Unfortunately, they died um, actually in the last year and stuff, quite many, like early 60s. Um, but yeah, but I think it's not just the cruel optimism, but but Belon's broader theorizing about effects and thinking through how we think politics and being in the world less in a sort of rationalist reasoning way and the effect of stuff. Yesterday I was doing a talk and someone was talking about the the undercommon over over no over the book about trees and the effect we have for trees. It's like a novel each chapter's about different trees and how people grew up with trees over grounds. Anyway, so the effect is like a really important aspect in our contemporary thinking and theorizing, especially when we're thinking about more environmental and climate and how we sensitize ourselves. So I think Belong's work has been like has spoken to people a lot just just because we think that effect is such a rich area of thinking about attachments, how we can use attachments in in better ways, or how they might be problematic, and um, it's just—I don't, I don't want to say it's just a fad, because I'm just being quite positive about it. But um, I'm not sure for how long that will be. But I was just thinking, you know, about what to do in this particular talk, and I just thought if cruel optimism might be a nice experimental way to think about resilience. Um, so for me, it's more of a pragmatic sort of heuristic use. And I think that I've been sort of true to Bill's understanding of cruel optimism. I couldn't swear to that. Yeah, good question. I'm not sure. What do you think? Why do you think cruel optimism is so, you know, it's had so much impact? Oh, well, I think it has to do with the enlightenment kind of ideology that human beings are rational and able to find solutions and that we are in charge of everything and that. Uh, like we're the most rational and the most capable and we have all this technology we have all this science and knowledge you know at our disposal that it just at our will that we can utilize all this knowledge and find solutions um yeah but i think we are reaching this point of disappointment with uh, the recent developments in international politics especially with ukrainian russian conflict that uh, people were expecting the sanctions to work on Russia and that this kind of action would somehow deter Russia from further um, intensifying its attack on Ukraine but at the end it just made things much worse and um, it was there was also sort of optimism that Ukraine Ukraine becoming a sovereign democratic uh, European modern state would kind of benefit uh, uh, the country, but this aspiration to join the European Union actually made things much worse at the end of the day. And I think people start questioning about whether there is a rational way out of international conflicts or like um, disasters. Yeah, but probably has to do with the enlightenment kind of philosophy that humans are smart. <laughs> I don't mm. know. 
Yeah, yeah. I guess everything speaks against them from the Ukraine war on backwards. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, so I don't think this is where you're going with your argument. Um, by this, I mean, you know, there are a whole range of like climate deniers and authoritarian regimes, or you know, just you know, like, I mean, China, Russia, I mean, the the previous regime in Brazil. Um, who would just say, yeah, all of this, all of this, like, we could have told you that this resilient stuff is kind of a liberal fable. Um, so, but I don't quite hear you, like, I don't think you're aligning yourselves with, 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 with those types. I think you're, you know, <laughs> I, think you're, I think you're distinguishing yourself, but maybe if you could, um, maybe defend yourself a little bit against the accusation that you might be like dangerously aligning yourself with the question. types. A little bit defensive maybe. <laughs> I'm pleased with that. Um, so it's it's true that um, resilience is close to our hearts and um, it is difficult to criticize resilience without appearing to be a climate change denial or, or other things. Because, um, because if resilience was going to be problematic, what what other option do we have? Either like a big business sort of industrialized geoengineering stuff, or just give up and like let everyone die. You know, maybe a few rich people might survive. So the need for resilience is is um it's like huge. So um my job as a critical academic is to critique things that other people might not critique or critique things in ways that other people might not critique them. Um, and then like the more thorough the critique is, the more the critique is based on an understanding at the heart of resilience, the better it is. So I think the key difference would be that when Trump or whoever is a criticized from resilience as a liberal whatever wishy-washy relational thing, they don't really understand resilience. If you know what I mean. Um, so I think our advantage, if we were to care for resilience, understanding it would be a good thing. So I'm sort of on the side of good people in that surely understanding something is what good people do. I wouldn't want resilience people to not want to understand resilience just because it seemed that the other options were really good. That would be, that, that would be what bad people do. That's what Donald Trump does. That would be like a fake news resilience. Couldn't like think critically about it. I want like a genuine news resilience. An informed resilience. Yeah, but if we're going to do resilience, we should like think about what's at, what's at stake in that. But maybe there isn't an easy second chance once we've given up on modernity. That um, maybe for some people who do resilience, they might be better off trying to defend more of a modernist approach if they thought that, you know, it's like. I'm just, I'm just putting stuff out there. That's all. Um, but yeah, I see the problem. However, I think it's a, the critique of resilience is generally a minority preoccupation. The understanding of resilience, I think, is a minority preoccupation. Especially when we're thinking of it in social, broader social ways, not in like ecosystem work and homes and that. You know, adaptive cycles, pan up. There's an interesting connection to hope and to history, and you mentioned sort of the futility of recreating the status quo. The status quo is depleting the planet at, at unprecedented levels. But the hope, I heard that interview this morning too with, with Matt Calloway, and, and in a sense, you kind of listen to these young, like very young climate activists and, um, and a, quite a seasoned uh, environmental politics person talking about the hope that they still bring to uh, to the next conference of the parties, and I wonder whether, I mean, you said something earlier about kind of the modernist project being dead, or the mod modernism being something we tried and, and we moved beyond, but, but what is the COP meeting if not a modernist effort to make sense of the world and then pledge our way into managing it so it's 
it's so my run speed. You agree with me or disagree? I, I'm agreeing with you, but I, I just <laughs> like like that is a form of cruel optimism, is it not? Yeah, I guess. I guess many things, many attempts to do things could be understood as a cruel optimism thing. Um, so, so that's true, but I was just thinking of this as, as particularly cruel because it's so particularly smug in its alternative to modernity, whereas the COP conference is more of a sort of desperate. I don't think there's a lot of smugness there. There's a, you know, so I'm, I'm more open to that. So. OK, well, I've heard nothing from the people online, hopefully. Oh, yeah, that's. I meant to ask, is anyone online got a question? Yeah, I, I'm assuming <laughs> they're, they're people. Well, oh, they are at home, so that's right. Yeah, yeah. But uh, uh, if there was assuming we're, we're not receiving any any you know, desperate questions from from cyberspace. When did we turn it off? No, I think oh, we're okay. still going. We're, we're, we're live as far as I can tell. I, I'm just not sure if they can chat properly, which might be beyond my uh, my capability to resolve. So I must say farewell. Oh, yes. <laughs> well, thank you very much. If you have any questions on online people, you can email me. Yep, yeah, we have your contact details. We'll be in touch. We have a living, relational um, connection with our, our PhD student oh, here and, and with Harvey. Yeah, that's a, that's a blood relation. Um, but thank you, David. It's been, been a wonderful opportunity. Thank you. Thanks for the challenging questions. Okay. Yeah, anytime. And, and uh, wonderful to meet you and to hear about your work. And uh, thanks to everyone online in the room uh, for. Yes, you burned it. <laughs>